Um, all right, last time we did Grand Canonical. A big picture, remember, we have models for chemical phenomenon. We want to put a, 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 a theoretical slant to that so that we can, so that just for that purpose sometimes, sometimes there's internal workings that are elucidated by said theoretical modeling. The modeling requires, uh, like an experiment, you can't hold internal energy and temperature constant at the same time. That, that's impossible. You can't hold pressure and volume constant. That's impossible. Uh, entropy and temperature, uh, well, no, no, entropy. Anyway, now I'm getting confused. Chemical potential and number of molecules, those can also not change. Now, typically, N is held constant because we have a metal box and a gas in it. That's physical chemistry history. Metal box plus gas and laser equals 90% of physical chemistry, right? So N doesn't change, so the chemical potential changes, in which case we're in the, we hold the temperature constant, we're doing canonical type of experiments. If you allow gas to permute in or out of said box, I don't know how you would do that, but if you did, you are now in the microcanonical type of world, and you would do that to hold chemical potential constant. That is also a good statistical model for chemicals reacting. Chemicals coming into or out of the box would be the same as products forming, that's chemicals coming in, and reactants reacting, that's chemicals coming out. That's actually the exact same thing thermodynamically. Okay, anyway. Now, from our discussion last time, I realized I probably should have reviewed chemical potential, right? And I have a very unique way of doing this, uh, which is part of my textbook. Did I mention I'm writing a textbook? Anyway, so I'm writing a textbook. And kind of like how I like to present everything is actually entropy, chemical potential, I, I try to put some very different slants on that than is traditional. So I wanted to cover chemical potential, then we're going to get back to the microcanonical, and then we're going to solve PV equals NRT, which I, I kind of, I didn't flub, I just didn't do it very well anyway. Okay, so when it comes to chemical potential, and I have three backup pins because they're all like slightly used and I don't know which how used. And then I got a fourth that completely new just in case. Okay, so I just want to review chemical potential. And uh, now it starts out kind of funky, which is that uh, it, whenever I'm going to introduce anything that's energy, I, I need to start with internal energy. That's the, since that is the energy a molecule has, that's always the easiest one to start with. Then we think about more than one molecule, and then that would need, naturally lead us to A and G. And those have more uh, entropy. Um, they take into account entropy more fully. I need more molecules to have entropy. Um, I don't know that I can really define entropy with a single molecule. That, that's kind of funky. Um, anyway, okay, so change in entropy. This is something I put on my grave. I'll remember this. Okay, now this is all about allowing number of moles to change. And we're going to talk about just one thing. Okay, now remember that this T is actually du ds at constant V. Minus P is du dv at constant S. And so now that I've introduced a new variable, I better keep the other guys constant. Okay. So um, du ds at constant V and N uh, minus P is the UDV at constant S and N, and then this is the UDV at a constant, constant S and T. So we're doing some permutations. And I'm going to do A. As I mentioned, A is nice because that's a constant volume deal. And when we're doing simulations, when we're physical chemists doing gas phase spectroscopy, we have a metal box. Um, volume is constant. And, and I keep flubbing this. This one I don't quite have memorized. Actually, uh, A is the one where everything is negative, well, except for this, this term. And, of course, I've got to hold T and V constant. Okay. Now, here's the thing about chemical potential. Now, obviously, these terms are the chemical potentials. How does the energy change with um, reactants? That would be negative. Products, that would be positive. Changing moles. Uh, now, of course, each one is useful under different conditions. U is my friend, it's kind of a microcanonical type guy, it's my friend at constant entropy and constant volume. But that's funky as heck because 
holding a system, especially a reacting system at constant entropy, uh, all right, I know how to do that. You can actually build this crazy type of piston to do that um, if you insulate it just the right way. And anyway, you can actually cause chemical transformations at constant entropy, but it's like really kind of a weird mousetrap. Or you can hold temperature constant. Now that makes a lot of sense and it's easy. Okay, so I like to think about this. Anyway, we know that we have different energies that are good under certain conditions. So it seems to me that we've got a different one of these, different type of chemical potential, which would be useful depending on the conditions. Okay, that means that I have to do all of my chemical potential stuff four different ways for the four different conditions. You know, constant S, constant V, that's U world, constant T, constant V, that's A world, constant P, constant F, constant T, that's G's world. Anyway, that sounds like a pain in the ass. Or, let me point this out. Um, a is U minus TS, and therefore, the change in A is the change in U minus T, change in S minus S change in T. I just use the product here. Um, I hope you're not having trouble seeing this. Okay, now this gets uh, a bit of a nosebleed, but it's relatively easy. I'm gonna, uh, I have this for the change in A. I'm gonna write this again. Minus SDT. Now I'm writing small for a very good reason. This is gonna get kind of hideous. It's hideously long, like often is the case. That's why this room is awful to be <coughs> in. Okay, so I just wrote the change in A, and that's equal to the change in U. I've got the change in U written right up here. TDS minus PDV um, plus the change in U, change in M, constant S, constant V, change in N. Okay, minus TDS minus SDT. Oddly enough, I claimed this correctly. Okay, so what? All right, well, now look at this. If I got minus SDT on one side and I got minus SDT on the other side, those will cancel. A equals A. Well, I just got one equals one. I got a minus P V V. I have that here. Um, T D S. I got T D S minus T D S on the same side. And look at that. I've got D A, D N at constant T V. And I'll just go ahead and say the D N's cancel. You can do that by the way. Is D U, D N at constant S and D. And so we can call that chemical potential because the way that an energy changes with moles, given the conditions, it's, it's friendly conditions, is the exact same quantity for all the energies at their constant friendly conditions. The point being, chemical potential is always the same. We can do any analysis with chemical potential, and we don't have to freak about uh, whether the box is permeable, whether it's a box or a balloon, whether we somehow have it in a crazy mousetrap at constant entropy, I can maybe show you how, how you do it. It's really kind of weird, but anyway. Um, or, or it's a constant temperature box, right? No matter what, we can do all of our chemical potentials the same way. All right, so with that, let's do the world's most boring example of ice melting. Now, what's kind of neat about this is um, that um, this is like kindergarten math, but it's um, quite meaningful. So anyway, so ice and water. That's just kind of funky because ice is water. Actually, it's quite useful for the proof I'm going to do. So ice melting. Or no, no, no. Sorry, equilibrium. We're going to do equilibrium, and then we'll do non-equilibrium. And let's see. Okay, so I've got ice, and let's say at zero degrees. Technically, we have to be at one bar pressure, and it, it's under those conditions. If I look up uh, now, remember that practically we tabulate information on chemical potential in a data table. Remember when you were in high school? Hopefully, you took chemistry in high school, and you were doing Hess's law questions. Um, a plus B goes to C plus D. What's delta G? Well, it's the Gibbs energy of formation of C plus D minus A plus B. All right, they were very easy questions that, of course, are appropriate for high school. And you had usually a data table in the back of the book that had Gibbs energy formation per mole. Those are chemical potentials. Um, now, remember that. All right, another funny thing, and I don't want to spend any time on this. As much as I would like to tabulate a chemical's absolute A, 
it's absolute G, it's absolute U, it's absolute H. You actually can't. Uh, it's Maybe you can, no one's really sure, but instead we, we always specify everything relative to a formation energy. Uh, the energy, it gives energy, let's say, that it takes to form a chemical from its elements. And if everything is done relative to that, then everything works out just fine. So if I look up the Gibbs energy of formation of ice water and liquid water at zero degrees in one bar, I see the same number. Those are exactly the same, right? And that's why they're at perfect equilibrium. Okay, so zero degrees, one bar pressure. Um, I know that the reaction of ice to water, um, and I'm going to use the correct symbology, delta reaction G is zero. Of course, I'll give it units. Maybe I'll give you an extra point on my Q next month if, if you do or don't remember that. Okay. Now I'm going to, uh, now for practical reasons, I'm going to do this at constant P and T uh, because I don't quite know how else to describe a floating ice cube. Uh, it, it necessitates constant pressure, constant temperature. Okay. And so the, the reaction, uh, not per mole, sorry, not per mole, would be uh, the chemical potential Again, this would be the Gibbs energy of formation per mole. Uh, per, that's actually important, per mole. It has to be per mole of ice. Okay, and the change in chemical potential energy of water. Okay, now the way to, uh, now of course this is zero. Anyway, okay. One thing hangs me up here is that as much as you probably look at this and nodding your head, why actually didn't I do products minus reactants? Why didn't I do that? So then I would have like, if I'm saying ice is melting, then I'd have water minus ice. That would be product minus reactant, right? That's a little confusing, right? For one, at equilibrium, there is no, what's the product, what's the reactant? It, that, that doesn't make sense. Number two, this is the change in one plus the change in the other. Now, all funkiness with Gibbs formation energies aside, when you're doing products minus reactants, that's the change. Or you could add the change in each one. They just happen to be the same thing. So this is, again, if I have only ice and water, and this is the change in one, the total change is the sum. So there you go. So this is, so don't take it for granted that you, know, you look at this and automatically know what to do. Because to be blunt, when I was writing my notes, I wrote um, water minus ice, and that's just completely wrong. Uh, anyway, just, just pointing that out kind of badly. All right, now, the reason that we always explain chemical potentials this way, if you model uh, a little bit of um, ice melting or water freezing, it doesn't matter, you automatically have this relationship. <laughs> they, they're the same thing. All right, so then, zero joules is, um, Okay, I have to make sure I get this right. So I'm going to say chemical potential of ice minus the chemical potential of water. And I have factored out, what did I factor out? There's, if, if you factor out ice or water, it, it won't change anything. I just, I, I chose to insert here, I, I chose to insert um, minus the change in number of moles of ice for the, uh, minus the change of number of moles of ice here, and then I factored it out. Right, yeah, that works. Okay. Now, I, I remember I said earlier on, I actually pointed out to you that at equilibrium, there are things happening. Remember I told you what, uh, okay, ice cube in water, put it in the freezer at zero degrees, it's perfect, wait a year, what happens? Nothing? It, it turns into a sphere, right? Remember I asked that? It would change shape. The point is that things are actually happening. Equilibrium things are happening, just not a lot. So it is possible for some of the ice to melt. It's not zero. So what's zero? Right. The change in chemical potential. The difference in chemical potential is zero. Therefore, the chemical potential of ice is equal to the chemical potential of water. The point is, is that equilibrium, everything has the same chemical potential, which is a bigger um, uh, facet of the fact that, heads up, all things at equilibrium have equal intensive variables. Pressures are the same, chemical potentials are the same, 
entropies per molar are the same. Anything that is um, intent, sorry, no, entry, that's not right. It, no, 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 that is right. Uh, anyway, chemical potentials are the same, pressures are the same. Anything that is an intensive variable are all equal for things at equilibrium. And, and so, uh, chemical potential, by the way, is an intensive variable. Energy is extensive, moles is extensive, so if you divide the two, you get intensive, and that's chemical potential. All right, now, at one degree Celsius, you know <coughs> that the uh, ice is turning into water. Okay, now that, that's a negative delta G. Remember that, uh, okay, and at constant temperature and pressure, that means G's my guy. G's my guy because it represents total entropy. If G goes down, total entropy goes up. Total entropy is in the driver's seat. It determines everything. However, under these conditions, it is equivalent to say that gives energy goes down. Remember, we covered all that. That's, that's horribly important. That's why everything happens, depending on the conditions. So, uh, now what I have to do is I'm going to do the same factoring. Uh, same factoring, so... Okay, let me... Uh, it, it, I can get a little bit cross out here if I, if I screw this up. Okay, change in moles of ice. And that is less than zero joules. Okay, so again, I get a less than because I need the change of G to be negative. Okay, now, obviously, this guy is negative. Ice is melting, so I'm losing moles of ice. Okay, if the whole thing is negative, that means that this has got to be positive. Therefore, the chemical potential of ice is greater than the chemical potential of water. Now remember that this is technically a chemical reaction. It's a really stupid, low-level, high school grade chemical reaction, but a chemical reaction nonetheless. And it shows you that when chemicals transform by melting or reacting, those are really the same thing. It happens because the chemical potential of one is greater than the other. Uh, now, it doesn't say how fast they'll react. I mean, obviously this can be arbitrarily slow. Uh, take methane and, and oxygen. Is that fast or slow? Uh, you want to say fast, don't you? Because you know I'm asking a true question at the same time. Right? It's incredibly slow. Unless you add a match. In which case, it's incredibly fast. <coughs> at STP, it's slow. In our data tables with delta G of formation, those are at STP. It'll happen, but it'll take eons. But it will happen. You eventually will get CO2. Or you can light a match and figure out your delta G's at different, uh, at a hotter temperature, and then you'll get different answers. Uh, but that's why the thing explodes. Anyway, uh, let's see, what did I want to say? Oh, okay, now I wanted to, uh, this is what I do a little different than other people, and that's a good segue. Uh, I want to connect back to high school uh, when you started doing Hess's Law questions, because, um, now, this is something I do for my undergrads, but I but I am kind of reviewing here because uh, based on what we were talking about last time, and there's a couple other neat things I can say about chemical potential. Okay, so I was talking about methane and oxygen. Uh-oh, I better, I always do this. Or I can look at my notes. I, I got to remember that there's a stoichiometry to this. And these are all, let's just say that they're all gas phase. Okay, uh, four hydrogens, four hydrogens, one, two, three, four, uh, four oxygens. There we go. Okay, I got it right. Now you know that, again, gives, uh, every one of these has got a formation gives energy per mole. Those are, those are the numbers that are listed in data tables in the back of your, uh, your freshman chemistry, your high school chemistry textbooks. I got one for each one of these. And the reaction G, not, uh, not per mole, now it would be under standard state conditions, um, and what you're doing is you're getting the uh, formation energy per mole of methane. Now the reason that, uh, of, sorry, sorry, CO2 products minus reactants. Now the reason that this isn't per mole is because I'm doing the mole right here. So notice I multiplied this one by um, plus, Jesus, how uh, No, it's just, you know, when you get to grad school, um, this stuff gets hard, even if you're the instructor. Okay, minus products, minus reactants. God, things I'm, 
I'm almost there. I, I want I really do try to get these symbologies correct because it does matter uh, if you're really being extremely careful we should be, right? Okay, so there's standard state is why we get the little circle. Uh, there's no per mole because I, I take care of that. I wipe that out when I put in the uh, stoke the um stoke the what do these call stoichiometric very yeah, stoichiometric variable or coefficient, stoichiometric coefficient. They uh, try to doubly data, and I have products minus reactants. Okay, and that's why uh, that's a reaction, not a formation. And these are numbers in the back of the book. Okay, now and then you were told if this is negative, then it's a spontaneous reaction. So it will go. It just doesn't say how fast. Ergo, my babbling about a spark or not. Uh, and so this would actually be very slow without a spark. Okay, so now you admit that if this is negative, the reaction is spontaneous. Again, we won't say about rate because that's completely different. But you agree, right? Yeah? And the number's in the table in the back of the book. Right? Okay. You're all dead wrong. That's actually incorrect. Because, now remember, in high school, a lot of things were told to you. A lot of things were told to you. But a lot of them were wrong. Because a lot of things get simplified because you're too little to under to, to, to you know you know to start doing you're not ready to do logarithms are you right you kind of have to if you're going to do this correctly things get simplified but unfortunately with equations if you simplify it you also made it incorrect you can't have you can't do that you can't simplify it and have it still be correct so that's what happened even when it came to this jazz this is actually not correct for one simple reason and let me walk you through it. The, the simple reason is the numbers in the data table in the back of the book, those are actually the wrong numbers. Now, think about where the numbers come from. CO2. Okay, now that's a gas. Whenever the Gibbs energy of formation of CO2 was measured, it was done in a container at room temperature. Now, and this is very idealized, but let's just say it was done ideally. The Gibbs energy of formation of CO2 was measured by, with CO2, it would have been by itself. I'm not going to adulterate it. It's going to be at room temperature and pressure. All right, we'll, we won't mess with that part. Obviously, we could, but it's done at room temperature and pressure. But most importantly, it was by itself. Nothing was mixed in, like H2O. What about the reactants? Methane and oxygen. Uh, methane and oxygen. That number in the data table in the back of the book is for pure methane, is for pure oxygen. But when you set up this reaction, you've mixed them together. Guess what? That changes the number in the table in the back of the book. But you're not using it, are you? Ergo, you did it wrong. The damnedest thing, the numbers you get from the table in the back of the book are incorrect for when you actually try to use them. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Come on, that's funny. So it turns out that mixing things changes these numbers. So what the hell do you do? Well, the guys who measured it should have measured CH4 and O2 in the presence of CH4 and, you know, one with the other. Okay, well now, hold on, now how many things do you measure in the presence of other things? Uh, now you've got infinite number of measurements. It's impossible. What you do is, for practical reasons, you measure these numbers in the data table in the back of the book by themselves, and you figure out how to correct that number. Every one of them has to be corrected for the presence of the other things that are there. Now, okay, so that sounds like a practical thing, but it also tells you why reactions uh, don't go to completion. Now, um, this actually isn't terribly difficult to prove, but the correction is, um, where the hell am I at? Okay, so let's, um, okay, so the corrected gives energy information, and I'm gonna take off the little, the little circle because I'm now not in a standard condition is, the number in the table in the back of the book plus RT LN activity. Okay. Now for a gas, you guys remember what, uh, and I'm going to call it A. Do you remember what activity is for a gas? Remember what activity is for a gas? Uh, under standard conditions, a pure gas under standard conditions, the activity is 1. The problem is that, okay, so I've got um, one bar CH4 at uh, room temperature. Um, the number in the table, uh, data table in the back of the book is usable. 
the problem is I'm bleeding in some CO, and some O2. I'm bleeding in O2. Now that number changes. Oh, and of course this number also is, is changing. I got it. You got to start working with that. This is the equation that tells you how to do it. Now activity before you started mixing them, this guy was one. So ln of, of remember I told you natural log, right? Ln of one is zero. So you can use the number in the table in the back of the book. But when you start mixing these two gases together, the, their activities drop from one. They actually turn. You can't be above one. They have to be less than one. They can't be zero either. <laughs> All right, anyway, activities are from zero to one, All right? So th these drop. So do you remember how, you probably covered this, so you probably forgot. Now, it's actually pressure, um, pressure in the mixed condition versus pressure in the pure state. The pressure in the pure state is defined to be one bar because that's where the number in the table in the back of the book is measured. The um, pressure in the mixed state is the partial pressure. So I'll call that species I. I'm talking about methane, so it's a partial pressure of methane. Okay, so you see what happens? I'm going to react methane with oxygen. And I'm going to, instead of doing the high school thing, I realize as soon as I mix them together, I've actually got to make a correction, I've got to make a correction to, to methane's numbers and all the others. This is the equation, I can actually show you how to derive this. It, it, this is technically an entropic effect, um, and we, we this is, by the way, it may look like the formula for work, which is actually heat. Uh, work is heat under constant temperature conditions, we're under constant temperature conditions. And if you divide by T, that ends up being entropy. So this is actually an entropic. This is, this is the entropic contribution to Gibbs free energy due to mixing. So again, I don't want to spend a lot of, I, I can show you the derivation, but just trust me. This, um, the number in the table in the back of the book has to be corrected by this thing. This is the entropic correction due to mixing. That's where it comes from. Activity for gases are easy. This is why we always do gases. The partial pressure over the initial pressure, the initial pressure is defined to be one bar. Uh, and that's because that's where that number came from. When this number was calculated for the table in the back of the book, it was done at one bar pressure. So it's only applicable there. Okay, so there you go. Now I correct this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy. Maybe there's no correction at the beginning of the reaction because they haven't formed yet. Um, now, uh, now I'm going to, um, uh, I, I need to calculate delta G for the entire reaction, and I need to include all those correction factors, and it turns out that you can do it um, relatively easy. Uh, let's see, what am I doing? Um, Okay, so for the reaction, uh, let me generis, let me let me put this in a more compact way. Delta reaction G is the sum of products, uh, stoichiometric coefficient. Um, uh, G per mole naught minus uh, reactant. Uh, delta formation G per mole naught. Okay, and then um, uh, okay, so that so then the real the real delta G is the uh, um, the the thing that you did in high school plus R T L N. Now you might recall this at the beginning of a reaction you have the um, it was, it was a matrix, it's usually called Q at the beginning of a reaction, uh, the reaction quotient, right? And that is a, a ratio of activities. Uh, it would be the activity of the products. Activity of the products, um, there we go, over the activity of the reactants. Okay, you recall that? Right? And then if the reaction is over, that means that delta G is now zero, and you stop calling the, um, the ratio of activities Q, you start calling it K, which is the equilibrium. That's what you call the equilibrium constant. Okay, so you see what happens is, as the reaction proceeds, I right, know for one, sorry, sorry, let me start over. When you set up the reaction, you've done your high school Hess's law. That's great. Hopefully you got A's, that's how you got into college in here. But now you realize in college that you actually need to include this correction factor. 
And these activities are relatively easy for gas species, species for liquids, it's unfortunately horribly difficult. Whatever, we're doing gas phase, so it's actually easy to calculate this. Now you let the reaction go forward. What happens is, this, uh, the activities change because these ratios change because the products are going higher, right? The initial um, activities of the products are zero because they, they have no partial pressure. So those go up. The activities of reactants go down because their pressure is dropping because they're reacting. They, they, if they, as they cease to exist, the pressure is dropped. So the coefficient of the um, activity ratio changes till this kills that. And then your delta G is zero. So at whatever ratio of activities gives you this equal to minus that, that is when your reaction stops. And then you can figure out what your, what your um, reaction yield is from the, again, from the activities. So there you go. So that is, again, that's a more of an undergrad, uh, first year grad student <laughs> explanation of rea why reaction works. Uh, and so I can plot um, the reaction G for, for, um, as for the extent of the reactant uh, reaction, where I have reactants on the left and products on the right. And what happens is, again, it's, it drops, which is great, but it may level out and stop before you get all products. Now, here's another explanation for this, by the way. So that's, that's a very hardcore math explanation, but let me give you a little bit more of a understand in words explanation. The question? Or maybe stretching your hand. You're just stretching your hand? Wait, <coughs> oh, me? Oh, yeah. no. Oh, okay, no, you're doing this. <laughs> anyway, it's pretty good. Um, minor detail, but for the alphas, uh, for the activities, you have to raise their supermetric coefficient. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. They, they would be raising their supermetric coefficient. And you know why that is? Um, because they're they're actually right up here. And then uh, A, L, and B is uh, uh, L, and B to the A. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. That's here and then here, right? Yeah. Um, okay, now let me give you an explain the word, you know, explain to a high school student. Why does this stop before you get to products? It's actually, it's entropy again. You see, entropy increases the more things mix. Now that's, that's quite obvious. I can prove it mathematically, but that's pretty obvious. As reactants form products, there's more mixing. There's more things. Instead of two things mixing, now there's four. Now, initially, there's not much of the other two, so it's not really four. It's like 2.1, it's 2.2. Like as you form more of these, but then when these are equal to each other, that's the maximum amount of entropy you could get. You get basically four equivalent species all mixed together. That is entropically the best point to be. But as you form more products, because again, you know, let me even get deeper, because the entropy of the outside is being maximized due to uh, enthalpy anyway. Uh, okay, I went a little too, too far down the rabbit hole, but anyway. So as you go to more and more products, you're actually starting to lose reactants, and that's now costing you entropy, right? See what I mean? If you go all the way, then you're back to your starting point. You just have, you have the same number of volts of gas you had to begin with. Entropically, you've done nothing, and that's bad. So that's, that's what's fighting the formation of full, of full products, is the entropy of mixing. Uh, now, now, again, you may think, like, well, then why doesn't every reaction hit just go to halfway. That's the, that's the entropic maximum. And the answer is, is because this is an exothermic reaction. And I, I said this a minute ago, but I wasn't out of it. Um, the reaction would like to go halfway because that's the best place for, that's the, that's the most random, most entropy you can have inside the box. But at the same time, the box can heat the outside through enthalpy. And that creates entropy on the outside. And so if you can keep going, Losing entropy on the inside, but creating more entropy on the outside, you will until you can no longer balance that out and then you stop. So there you go. So that's why things react. Yay! Let me. You don't care. <laughs> okay, I got about uh, ten minutes left. Let's go back to the grand canonical. And um, again, I would rather do that one last time. One thing to look out for, um, so by the way, now that you're, all, uh, you're all, almost all in groups, uh, I'm going to be talking to your advisors about what classes they would like to see you in. 
you guys were a weird bunch because uh, a lot of you went to different groups than we thought you were. So we, we held back on putting you into certain classes. Now that you're in groups, I'm going to talk to your, you know, don't, don't worry, all right? So, so you will see me in your advisor's office and you'll hear your name if you walk by. So don't freak, all right? I'm just asking them what class they'd like to see you in. I don't really, you know, if you join my group, I'm a physical chemist, all right, but you would be synthesizing semiconductors. That doesn't make you a physical chemist. My students, you can take any class you want. I don't care, right? Now, other folks have a bit more of an agenda. So anyway, I'm going to work that out with them. Um, and now that you're in groups, we can do that. Uh, and I forgot why I'm talking about this. So anyway, so I don't know what classes you'll be in. Um, but the thing is, when it comes to StatMech and a lot of other classes, Often these derivations are the entire period. Sometimes there are two periods of just nothing but derivation. And within five minutes, you're like, wait, what the hell are we even doing? Right? Sorry, that happens. I mean, I, I, will, I certainly will try my best. But I do understand, and I, and I think you follow, that sometimes when I'm just doing derivation, 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 that there really is no other way to do this. And you really can get lost, like, what the heck is the point? So. Sorry, be aware that that is happening, though, and that will often carry the day. Okay, so now remember that the grand canonical uses uh, a different statistical definition. It, it, we work with a Legendre transform of entropy. We can insert Boltzmann's equation into that new Legendre, um, new entropy thing to define uh, what comes out of it is a new partition function. So I see the sum of states, which comes from Boltzmann's formula. And I start out looking at, uh, looking at something that looks a lot like the canonical partition function, but it's got this jazz um, tacked onto it. And that changes a lot of things. Now, having Legendre transformed away entropy's dependence on n, which is fixed, Instead, I put it on U, chemical potential, which is fixed, and now N can fluctuate. So when I am doing, when I work in the grand canonical world, I'm at constant temperature, constant volume, constant chemical potential. That means N fluctuates, and that's funky. But it has its purposes. Now, whenever I'm trying to solve a chemical phenomenon, I use the partition, I use the statistical paradigm that is the easiest. So if I'm trying to solve P equals NRT, it turns out that the grand canonical is my buddy. Okay. Now, um, there were certain properties of it that I, I don't know are particularly interesting, but they are properties nonetheless, such as um, the natural log of it is beta PV. Um, the derivative of the natural log of the grand canonical partition function with respect to its guy, which is basically beta u, is the average number. Uh, now, again, in the grand canonical world, it's a box, but things can somehow magically come in and out of it. And again, that sounds funky, but it has its uses. And the double derivative of the partition function, which is just the derivative of the average value in m. Uh, so this is the double derivative with respect to beta chemical potential. Double derivative here. So anyway, it's a little funky here. Um, is the variance in N? Well, of course, variance is um, uh, is the average N squared minus. Okay, this is just pure high school statistics for you. What is a variance? That's the variance. Okay, so. Uh, this is just what we did last time when it was dying. So um, I promised you I would get to PD equals NRT, and so I'll do that. Um, if you recall, what we did was, and I didn't do a very good job of this because I was getting a little plummet because I was running out of time. I'm kind of doing it again uh, right now. Um, that I had, what have I done? Um, we had taken a box. Back up, it's brand new, so I know it works. Anyway, so we had taken a box and we had divvied it up into m squares. Okay, so I got to do the. There we are. Oh, oh, 
I messed it up at the right anyway. Okay, so we had taken a box and filled it up with M squares, and what we had found was that the variance is roughly equal, the variance in the population is equal to the average population. This kind of makes sense to me. If you're going to fluctuate molecules in and out, it's going to fluctuate more if you have more there to begin with, right? <laughs> um, how can you have 100 molecules coming in and out unless you have 100 to begin with, right? That doesn't make sense. You can't have 100 molecules coming in and out when on average there's only one in the box to begin with. Now remember, that this box is permeable. Molecules come into and out of the box for weird reasons, but anyway. So we had uh, done this little derivation. Again, I was a little bit um, flum flummoxing. Then now let me just remind you what I just wrote: that the change in the number of um, molecules with respect to the chemical potential. Um, don't worry about so much the beta. Is the variance, which is equal to the average. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply. I'm going to multiply, I'm going to flip this and multiply it by volume. Now the reason is, is that um, number of, uh, average number divided by volume is density, by the way, just want to point that out. Um, okay, and the, now I'm going over here, remember I've got to multiply by volume, but I, I flipped everything over. Uh, you'll see why in a minute, I know it's funky. Okay. Now again, this is just from the grand canonical messing around with taking derivatives of natural logs and recognizing I've got the sum of probability times average number. Wasn't terrible. I've taken this, I flipped it over, multiplied by V. Um, now V over N is actually volume per mole. It's also one over the, the um, density, number density, so number density. Um, instead of being D, it's, called, it's usually called rho since of number density. Um, so just point that out. Okay, now I'm almost at, at PD equals NRT. Sorry, maybe just a minute over. Uh, this is actually really easy. It's only going to take one minute. Okay, I just want to know that the, the change in Gibbs energy per mole is the change in entropy per mole um, plus the volume per mole dP. You need to go over here. And now remember also big picture, um, PV equals NRT, uh, putting Boyle's law and Avogadro's law and Charles's law together is not a derivation, so that's what we're doing. Anyway, all right, so I, I've got this for delta G. Well, what I do with that is um, I know that the change, uh, and this of course is the change in chemical potential, so the change in chemical potential with respect to what? Change in volume per mole, the constant T. Okay, when I do constant T, I wipe that out. So if I do change in volume per mole, constant T, I wipe that out, so I see that that is volume per mole, dp, d, Okay, so I just I just manipulated this just to point this out, just so it wasn't like kind of out of nowhere. Okay, now I'm going to do a um, God, a chain rule. I think this is the chain rule, right? What if you remind me? Change in chemical potential, change in volume per mole, constant T. Change in volume per mole, uh, change in number density at constant T. Volume per mole, change in pressure. Change in volume per mole constant T, change in volume per mole, uh, change in rho constant T. Okay, so uh, chain rule, right? Okay, and then I'm going um, right, to do this quickly. Beta, I'm multiplying by beta as well. Change in U, change in, in rho at constant T. That is actually this change in beta chemical potential, beta chemical potential, change in rho, and this is actually uh, n over v is rho. You can do that, by the way. n over rho is equal to um, 
uh, let's see, I've got DP, D row. Uh, uh, oh, wait, what am I saying? VM. VM is one over row. That, I got a little confused there. DP, D row. Okay. Uh, I forgot. I multiply this by beta. I got to multiply that by beta. Sorry. Right, sorry, sorry. Beta, P, P row, and one. So I just multiply row over here. Okay. And that's it? That's actually P equals on our team. If you don't see it, let me. Uh, Remember that you can you can really play fast and loose with um, partials. I can integrate this. I'm going to bring row over here, and I'm going to integrate that. So I've got um, A B T P is equal to um, uh, row with, with row, which is n over b. So now I've got. Um, no, what am I, ah, oh, sorry, sorry, beta is 1 over KBT. Okay, so now I've got PV is KBT average number. But then I remember that um, R over NA, that I got this number is KB, and N is um, number of moles. Uh, what am I doing? Um, and a, no, what am I doing? And, um, I swear to God, this always throws me off. This is absolutely ridiculous. This is incredible. I have to look at my notes if I'm lost. Um, N is N over NA. So if I, um, uh, um, uh, N, N. So average number is N times NA. There we go. Okay. NRT. There we go. P equals NRT. Got it. Jesus. Freaking algebra. So off. All righty. Whoop-dee-doo. PV equals NRT. That's the actual proof. You can also find it on Wikipedia. Uh, but the point is, is what, it, what it is, is when I have a gas, if molecules are going to diffuse into and out of the box, and we allow it because we work in the grand canonical, that's fine. But to follow the rules of thermodynamics, it also has to be true that this is true. Otherwise, we get a violation of the laws of thermodynamics. So that's how to see this proof. Again. Fluctuations in density, which is allowed in the grand canonical, are fine. It's designed to do that, and everything works out just as the way it should, as long as this is followed. Then all the rules of thermodynamics are, are followed. But this has to be true. That's what this proof actually did in the, the broader context. So these, of course, are all the other stuff. So, all right. Um, if you folks, sorry, I did hold you five minutes too long.